Well, welcome. It's uh, Sunday the 14th of April, uh, racing along through the year and uh, very, very firmly into the grip of autumn with dim prospects of what is to come in terms of uh, dipping temperatures and uh, short days and long nights and uh, winter woolies and all of the other horrible things that come along with uh, winter in uh, Gauteng. But I trust that our fellowship together will be warm this evening, even on this virtual platform. Uh, we come to our next in the series of The Way of the Wise. Our series through Proverbs that I call the Life Shaping Series in Proverbs, and I trust that it has been there for you thus far, shaping your life, uh, touching your faith, strengthening your view of God, and uh, certainly in the weeks and months to come as we get into much more of the practical application, I trust that the Lord would continue to speak and to mold us. So um, we come particularly this evening to just consider one verse, that's Proverbs 18 verse 2, along with many others, but that'll be our primary focus under the banner of closed mind and open mouth. And I'll explain why in a moment or two. But uh, before we dive in, let's pray and ask for the help of the Lord through the power of the Spirit of God to come and indeed apply His Word to our lives, to our hearts, and to shape us and to mold us, even as we hear from Him this evening. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you thanks just again for the opportunity at the tail end of another Lord's Day, to just quieten ourselves, to gather together, to listen to your word. I'm thankful, Lord, for the opportunity that we had to do that this morning and to fellowship together even around the Open Doors presentation. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for the ministry that unfolded this afternoon down at Fountains. And again, Lord, we would just plead with you that as your word was sown or watered, that your spirit would indeed grant the increase and bring those that are lost to salvation and uh, strengthen the hearts of saints, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for the many new and, oh, in fact, temporary staff members that were there just uh, hanging around and listening. And, Lord, again, we just pray for them that uh, mm -hmm. what was heard and said would uh, strike a chord within their own hearts mm -hmm. and uh, use even that spin-off ministry to, uh, to further your kingdom. So, Lord, we do pray that as we continue our journey this evening through Proverbs, that you would continue just teaching us, shaping us, instructing us, and molding us to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly in our attitudes and our speech, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I don't know if you've ever asked directions of somebody who just didn't know where they were and where they were, uh, where they were and how to actually get you to a particular place, but they wouldn't admit that they didn't know. And they gave you a whole set of intricate instructions that really just stem from pure ignorance. But their ego and their ignorance just wouldn't admit that they didn't know. And uh, so that you were sent on a, on a wild goose chase. Maybe it's, maybe it's even closer to home. And have you ever been in a vehicle with a friend, a spouse, a family member? And it's patently clear that they've got absolutely no idea of directions. The GPS isn't working. There's no data for Google Maps. Uh, but they just won't stop and ask for any help. And uh, they just keep driving, refusing to uh, seek help from someone. And all the, all the while just getting more and more lost. There it is really, really almost impossible uh, for them to admit, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. I haven't got a clue and I need help. Well, let's be honest. How easy is it or maybe how hard is it to utter the words, I don't know? I just don't know. I guess we say that all the time. Maybe uh, we refuse to say that because we, I don't know, just don't want to seem incapable in a particular situation. Uh, maybe you think it's going to affect your reputation with others. Uh, quite po possibly that it's just pride at play, mm -hmm. not wanting to actually seem uh, inferior or uh, not clued up in a particular area. Uh, I guess it's uh, manifest even in terms of one-upmanship. Up one just can't be seen to be less informed than someone else. It's like kids in a discussion, and the one always needs to be better than the other. And they just construct these elaborate webs of what they've done or what they know supposedly to be better than the next kid who just spoke about their holiday or their meal or their party or what they've experienced or what they learned about something. And a little Johnny who comes next in line just can't kind of be worse off than that and has to almost deceitfully construct a whole story in terms of one-upmanship. We've got to just be better than the next person. In fact, we see that pattern of saying things and doing things in a totally uninformed way 
And I guess if we boil it right down to its absolute kernel, to its absolute core, to what the to what the primary driver is, it is pride. And uh, pride fooled or pride fueled folly will just not acknowledge wrong. Will just not acknowledge that somebody needs help. That actually foolishly just persists down that particular path. And I think we see that, we've tasted that, we've experienced that. If, if we're honest with ourselves, we've probably uh, done it ourselves as well. And that can not only be embarrassing to us, but it can have bad effects on others when we just don't know something about something, but refuse to admit that and actually then purport to have some opinion, to have some uh, information about a particular thing. The Wonderful little book called by a gentleman called Fred Smith uh, called Leading with Integrity, The Pastor's Soul. And uh, he says in that book the following, he actually recounts an episode about pastoral ministry. And uh, Fred Smith says the following. Recently, a wealthy young man came to see me with some problems in an area beyond my expertise. After listening a bit, I said, I have no experience with what you're talking about. And the young man replied, but, but you have an opinion, don't you? And Smith said, I would hope I would be considerate enough not to give you an opinion on an area in which I have no knowledge. I like my opinion to be worth something, and I have no opinion that is worth anything regarding your situation. And then he gives this comment. The young man was disappointed, but I felt good about my response. I was afraid that if I gave him my opinion, because of his respect for me, he would have taken it as advice. That is really helpful. I don't know what you make of uh, Smith's approach in that particular case, but I think he may well be onto something there. He chooses to hold back on an opinion that might be poorly shaped and badly informed, lest the other person takes it as active advice that's worth latching onto just based on their respect for you. They've got you up on some degree of pedestal and high, uh, high, uh, hold you in high regard. And in a sense, the opinion actually becomes advice. Mm. And I think what he's saying in essence is, I don't know but I'm not willing to come across as trying to know something about that, which I actually don't. And that's really where we want to poke and prod this evening, and I hope it will be a help uh, for us in that way. Last week, we considered the very important matter of jumping to conclusions. And I said to you, it's important to try and stop sometimes, hit the pause button, uh, to consider the other side of the story before we jump to conclusions. And I, I just want to take a probably a minute or three uh, just to recap where we were last Sunday for those that might be joining this evening for the first time without the backdrop of last week. Because we basically considered the, the, the issue of hastily coming to conclusions. And I give you a couple of pointers publicly to, to counter that. Firstly, uh, we asked the question, is the source reliable? From Proverbs 20, verse 19. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simpler babbler. And I quite simply said, if the person is known to be unreliable in terms of how they handle information, mm -hmm. don't trust what they have to say and uh, don't jump to a conclusion based on that. Flowing from that, get sufficient information. And if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame, as we read in Proverbs 18, verse 13. So just get information uh, before you have something to say. And linked with that, uh, be aware of one-sided perspectives. Just a few verses after that in Proverbs 18 and verse 17, we read, The one who states his case seems first seems right until another comes and examines him. And that's the issue. There are two sides to every story. And in a sense, we need the wisdom to uh, to weigh those issues up, particularly in the co context of conflict and tension and counseling and so forth. Linked with that, just be slow to speak. Uh, do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. We saw in Proverbs 29 verse 20. Then be slow to act. Um, for what your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring to court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Just slow down. Maybe you don't have all the information, all the facts and figures. And if you act too hastily on what you th on the little that you think you know, uh, it actually could be quite embarrassing. And then lastly, I challenge you in terms of just checking your motives uh, from Proverbs 24 and uh, not rejoicing when your enemy falls and not uh, being glad when he stumbles. Why are we actually sometimes so uh, almost magnetized to uh, jump into conclusions and we need to ask what, uh, what we're actually wanting or thinking about the other person? 
But Falke, as we worked through those issues in that content, my counseling mind was at work and I got to ask my favorite question, why? It's an important question. <laughs> why is it that we jump to conclusions? Why is it that we feel the need to share our opinions on matters with such passion and so conviction, but often with little to no knowledge about the actual issues at hand? Why do we make pronouncements about events and current affairs and politics and sport and church life and people's lives and where they go and what they do and how they spend their money and their finances and their doctor and their health care when we actually know so little about the issues at hand and them and so forth? What is it uh, that causes us to jump to conclusions in that way. And that led me back to reconsider Proverbs 18, verse 2. And we want to poke and prod into that this evening because I think it cuts down to the heart issues that are at play for all of us. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2, quite simply reads as follows. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Poke off the top of your head, what do you think Solomon's saying? What jumps out at you? Do we not get the sense of someone who wants to sprout forth, but actually knows very little about the subject at hand? I love the way Derek Kidner, and he's a renowned commentator, and as he commentates on this verse, he says the following, quote, The double trouble of the fool is his closed mind and his open mouth. Let's think about that. The double trouble of the fool is his closed mind and his open mouth. You see, I think Kidna's right. The fool doesn't really want to gain knowledge. He only wants to share his own views. It's like the man, and I think I shared this uh, last year or maybe a bit before in in a sermon once that I encountered at the Randburg Licensing Department when I was renewing my license a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, he was sitting close to me in the initial line before we even got to the eye tests. And uh, I was reading a book on sanctification, five views on sanctification. I don't think he knew anything about sanctification, but proceeded to tell me what he thought he knew. And uh, then we had the misfortune of being in the cashier's line after that to go and pay, which took a good number of hours. And um, I mean, this guy in the stairwell there at Randberg was just sprouting forth about everything, about sport, about coaching, about team selections, about the Springboks, about the Proteas, about politics, about uh, uh, the ex-president, whatever he had to say, he had to say at quite loud volume. And one could sense this growing irritation in the line. We weren't going anywhere in a hurry until it erupted and people were actually telling him to just be quiet and chirping him and opposing him and uh, at times telling him to actually shut up because it was just so irritating because There was an opinion about absolutely everything, and uh, he held forth in that particular environment. That's what Kidna is on about, a closed mind and an open mouth. And I think we want to just dig into that a little bit this evening and uh, see how that unfolds for us and what the Lord would be saying to us. And so we're going to use that framework. If the double trouble of a fool has a closed mind and an open mouth, let's just unpack Proverbs 18 verse 2 in that way. Firstly, the first area of trouble is the closed mind. And we can see that there in the opening uh, clause, can't we? A fool takes no pleasure in understanding. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding. Well, here's a basic insult to your intelligence question to start us off. What does a biblical fool not do? Well, according to the verse, a biblical fool, and this is not somebody who's stupid, or has a low IQ. This is somebody who's got a spiritual problem. A biblical fool takes no pleasure in understanding. And I think we need to just grapple with what that actually means. To take no pleasure in understanding means that you've got absolutely no desire or intention or interest in acquiring information, no desire to have your mind stretched, no desire to have issues challenged and uh, and interrogated. The fool doesn't want to gain knowledge. The fool only wants to share his own views. The fool prefers to give his opinion rather than acquire wisdom. This is the person who talks lots and lots and lots. They won't hear. They won't think. They absolutely oftentimes don't even hear what you're trying to communicate because you're just getting a barrage of speech all the time. Engagement and discussion 
and debate and learning and dialogue and interaction and iron sharpening iron kind of conversation is not for this person. Do you know somebody like that? Uh, the fool who takes no pleasure in understanding? Know anybody like that? And I hope it's not the person looking back at you in the mirror. But if it is, may the Lord be gracious to stir conviction even within you this evening. So that's the first area of trouble that this verse exposes for us, the closed mind. But Solomon hastens to continue. The second area, balancing that out or driving that further, in a sense, is this. If a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, what do they do? They delight in expressing their opinion. They only delight in expressing their own opinion. This person loves telling what's on their mind, delights in airing their own opinion. This person, this biblical fool, has a love affair. They have a love affair with their own ideas, with their own opinions, with their own thoughts, with their own prejudices, with their own worldviews, uh, with their own little bit of knowledge, and they love to show off what they think they know. Now, let's, let's be fair. At times, they might know something. It might, there, be a, there might even be a little bit of knowledge. They might have some insight about something. But oftentimes, that's not the case. Oftentimes, what is shared and aired is nothing more than just hot air. They take no pleasure in understanding, but only in airing their own opinion. Look, I know this is not a biblical quote, but it comes from a Frenchman called Joseph Hubert. And he says the following, those who never retract their opinions love themselves more than they love truth. Let me just read that again. Th those who never retract their opinions love themselves more than they love truth. Jabeh puts his finger on the issue. It's pride. It's self-love. We're so consumed with our own issues and our own hyperinflated view of our own importance and uh, our own cleverness that we're not actually willing to be challenged and to be corrected. And that is so evident at times to everyone else except to the person who's the fool. Why do I say that? Because Solomon says that. In uh, Proverbs 13, verse 16, if you're taking notes, we read this. Every prudent man acts with knowledge. But listen to this. A fool flaunts his folly. A fool flaunts his folly. Can you see the contrast in the verse? If you were in Bible Hour last year, and I think it was in the third quarter, if I'm not mistaken, around about July, August, early September, uh, when Ashwin and I were tag-teaming on that, in the uh, digging, digging to, into God's Word wisely. And when we came to poetry and biblical wisdom, you would have uh, learned about that, all the Hebrew parallelisms. Well, this is an antithetical parallelism. It does that for some good Sunday night uh, teaching. The prudent man is contrasted with the fool, and knowledge is contrasted with folly. You see, folks, it's the prudent person, the wise person who knows something about something and is able to act on that. That knowledge shapes his life, shapes his choices, shapes his interactions, shapes what he does in a wise way, in a godly way. And in the, overflow, in the overall flow of uh, Proverbs, that leads to safety, that leads to life, it leads to health, it leads to blessing. But in this verse, we see the contrast. The fool is so different. They know little about anything, but they flaunt the very little that they do know. A fool flaunts his folly. Why? Well, we can understand that as we go to another passage. Uh, we, we're going to assume that Solomon was the writer of Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we read this. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. You see, folks, there's a certain demeanor. There's a certain attitude that radiates out. And it just screams out to people, I'm a fool. I'm, opinion uh, I'm opinionated about everything. I'm a loud mouth, but I know nothing. It's almost like a, a neon sign that's activated when their mouth moves. And it just flashes out there, fool, fool, fool. He says to everyone that he is a fool, even when he walks down the road. And people are like that. Their actions, their responses, their speech, their um, shallowness of insight, uh, their deficiencies in, in information and content are self-evident 
to everyone in a social context, at the Randburg Licensing Department, in a in a in a church meeting, in a committee meeting, in a in a workspace, where whatever the case might be. They think they know something, but actually when they open up the Yabba box to say something, it proves you actually know very, very little. And, and the sad thing is one would expect this from a child who is still growing. And even there, I guess, in terms of good shepherding and good parenting, the, the trend and the pattern should be confronted. But, I mean, children are prone to this, aren't they? They, they parade information as though the, they're the resident experts on something. They grab, grab onto some tidbit from a school buddy or a teacher, and they sprout that out with confident pride. But it's clear that it's really, really deficient, and they actually know nothing. In fact, uh, uh, Ariella was on a school trip, a school outing this week, and she, she came back and recounted to us some of the conversations that happened on uh, the school bus, uh, even going to the Sai Bono Museum. And it seems, if we understand the story correctly, that the grade four seem to be the most informed political commentators there are, because a whole lot of opinions were being sprouted forth about the EFF and the MK party and what's going to happen to the country and the elections and so forth. They actually know nothing. And probably little crumbs that they picked up from mom or dad or aunt or uncle or uh, maybe a news broadcast on 702 on the way to school. But it gets taken and amplified and uh, these pronouncements are made from a position of sheer uh, deficiency in information. That's children. But how much more pathetic it is when it's a grown man or a grown woman. And folk, I'm sure you've encountered that. School, varsity, that work meeting, that committee meeting. Uh, the family Christmas lunch, Bible study maybe, and you've got Miss Know-it-all, and you've got Mr. Cannot be corrected, and a Mrs. I'm the expert on absolutely everything. And these are the people that the Bible, not me, the Bible labels as a biblical fool whose opinions have become facts and universal truths in their own minds. And they're the resident expert on world events, on sport, on parenting, on church life, on theology, on pretty much everything there is to, to say. Now, we're believers. We're doing this context. We're doing this study in the context of, of local church. And, but we need to just realize that the local church is not immune from this. Let's be open and honest and blunt. I might hurt your feelings, but it's the, the Spirit of God applying, applying the Word, not, not be manipulating anything. I'm sure that we've heard people, and I, I hope it's not me and I hope it's not you, who have their hobby horse, who love to stir on that particular issue, who love to throw that into the mix just to get a response, to get a reaction. But that particular person doesn't really want to read. They don't want to be stretched they don't want to gain broader, richer information on a particular issue. They're the kind of person who in a group or in a discussion or in a Bible study or whatever the case might be will want to say, let me show off my intellect. Let me try and stump the Bible study leader with some, I don't know, half-baked insight about one of the hot potato issues. I'll, I'll throw election into the mix or some aspect of eschatology or whatever and snigger, snigger. Let's see what he's going to do with that one this evening. But when you ask them to go and read a book, supply some articles, give some YouTube clips to actually go and stretch and get some views and counter views on that particular issue, no, that's, that's too much effort. And I don't want to grapple with it in that way. But I love to be able to stir the pot and show myself to be trying to kind of clever in terms of trying to trick somebody out. And uh, I guess we've, we've, we've heard that. We've encountered those kind of situations. I was at a seminar many years ago at the English Reformed Church where uh, Good Neighbors Bookshop is uh, up there in North Riding and uh, it was, they were busy launching the Puritan Study uh, the Puritan Study Center down at the University of Bloemfontein and it was part of that launch under the banner of, uh, I think it was Yale, uh, Yale or Harvard, Yale I think, and um, one of the, the professors was out, a uh, specialist on Puritans and the, the study of Puritan theology and uh, he had presented and then there was a Q&A session after that and uh, there was a local Baptist pastor who is known for shooting from the hip and, uh, and actually shooting his mouth off in a particular way, got up and asked this long, intricate, rambling question. And quite frankly, after about five or six or seven minutes of asking the question, it became apparent that all he was doing was parading his own knowledge 
rather than actually genuinely trying to get clarity on a particular issue. He thought he knew something about something, and well, there's an audience that I can impress, and I'll actually get up and uh, and uh, shoot my mouth off in that particular way. And it becomes embarrassing actually seeing that in action. Everyone around can see. That's what we saw in Ecclesiastes. The fool is evident even when he walks down the road. And when he opens his mouth, it becomes clear to everyone that he's a fool. And fuck, this is so different. I need to just be fair this evening and counterweight this with the, the young, young believer who's just wanting to grow and loves to learn and humbly engages and asks questions for clarity and for insight and hangs on information and takes stuff and learns stuff and reads stuff and devours articles and listens to YouTube clips and asks for books on loan and so forth and is just a is desirous of learning and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we commend that. We, we long for that. That's what we should be doing in terms of uh, trying to increase our own knowledge and our own insight. But far, quite frankly, we're back to where we started off, didn't we? Now, Proverbs 18, verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Can you see the heart attitude exposed here? That's why I wanted to poke and prod into it again this evening. Remember where we were last Sunday morning? God's word being living and active, double-edged sword, cutting right down into the division of bone and of marrow, of soul and of spirit, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God's word, like Proverbs, cuts us open and exposes our own thinking and our own deficiencies and our own purposes and our own desires. And uh, certainly from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts and sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and coveting and wickedness and deceit and sensuality and we slander. But then Jesus says, and pride and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So when we're looking at this issue of a closed mind linked with an open mouth, we've got to recognize it's not just a character flaw. This is not just a learned pattern. This is a heart issue. It's a sinful heart of pride and foolishness that wants to self-promote, that refuses to learn, that refuses to engage. This is not something that we just easily correct. This is something that requires the movement of the Spirit of God deep within us to indeed put sin to death by the power of the Spirit of God. And so, folk, with that in mind, let's ask the question, if it's not just a behavioral issue, not just a speech issue, that it's a heart issue, how do we counter this pattern? And I think we get the answer in Proverbs 3, verses 7 and 8, where Solomon says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. That's just one. But I think it's a, a key area to start with. We're back to the fear of God, where we were in the weeks prior to Easter. A high view of God and a real desire to honor Him and to glorify Him is going to drive us from being wise in our own eyes and is going to drive us towards that which is revealed in His Word. A rightful focus on God and of Christ and who Christ is and how we should be conformed to Him is going to be driving us away from shallow, deficient, and potentially evil thinking as we come with our closed minds and our open mouths. And so, folks, as we tie the threads together this evening, allow me to ask some probing diagnostic questions. They might be painful, but they're necessary ones to ask. And think about yourself, not the person that you really wish had logged on this evening that the, he or she might be hearing this. Think about yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror of God's Word. In what areas are you as an individual prone to not take pleasure in understanding? In what areas do you love to share your own opinion, but often without much knowledge to back up that opinion? And once you've grappled with that, ask the question, what do you think your own heart motives might be? What's fueling that from within? John Calvin said that the human heart is a veritable factory of idols and pride. And we've got this constant manufacturing plant within us that pushes us in those directions. Is that true for you? And then linked with that, broaden it out. 
How is it possible to possibly involve others, trusted spiritual advisors, friends, family, your spouse, your children, uh, fellow leaders within the church to, to see if this is maybe a blind spot for you? Have you got a closed mind and an open mouth, just not willing to hear and learn, but wanting to pronounce on particular areas? And then make it real. In what practical ways could you, in very real, tangible ways, learn to curb your opinions on, dis on issues and develop a more willing ear to listen and to hear and to engage before just launching forth into another uh, tsunami of verbosity. Linked with that, parents, how do you help your children? They're particularly prone, are they not, to shoot their mouths off, often with little or no substance? How do we, in terms of just good shepherd care, uh, even within our own homes, uh, help our, our kids to be better hearers and listeners and engagers on issues uh, without actually coming as biblical fools, little biblical fools, and uh, saying lots with little to no substance. But folk, above all, may the mind of Christ be formed within us. I quoted from that hymn last week, May the Mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. And I'm not going to do that again this evening, although it's a great prayer. But I am going to quote a few lines from the famous hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Not my own opinion, not my own thoughts, not my own foolishness, but edifying words from God. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Come, Lord, and change my mind, change my thinking, inform me more about issues. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. You see, we need to be corrected even at that purpose level. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. And folk, with those kind of prayers ringing in our minds, may the Lord indeed come and uh, correct us. In, against that issue of being closed-minded and open-mouthed so that we can indeed move forward in a way that is God-honoring in terms of our speech and our conduct in a way that uh, honors Him and that benefits other people. And folks, with that in mind, let's pray. And then I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to pray and then stop the recording. Uh, but if any other folk want to pick up, we've got about four minutes left. Let's come and you know, just pray along some of those tracks this evening. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had just to be together, to learn together, to be shaped together. Indeed, Lord, we're putting ourselves under the scalpel, the double-edged sword of your word, and it's not particularly pleasant to have that kind of surgery being done, but it's important that we hear this. It's important that we see ourselves in the mirror of your word. So, Father, I do pray that you would just continue to do your work through the power and the ministry of your spirit to take the inspired word of God, that which is God-breathed, and to teach us and rebuke us and correct us and train us in righteousness mm -hmm. so that we together, corporately and individually, men and women, mm -hmm. boys and girls, teens, young people different from different ages and backgrounds and ethnicities may indeed be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Achieve that in our hearts individually. And uh, in our church, we pray in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.